so this is the, uh, the working part, not that the rest of it wasn't, uh, but this is where we really want to take some of the ideas that have been developed through the talks and that we've had a little bit of time to discuss uh, to kind of flesh out, uh, go into more detail, and ultimately uh, would love to be able to translate into uh, sort of tangible actions. And so uh, I'm going to be kind of leading this part. Uh, Gene is going to be uh, taking some notes and also trying to keep track of the order of people uh, who are talking. Um, what I want to do is first present what I captured um, uh, from the discussions to this point. And so these I've identified as key points, and I, they are roughly rank ordered uh, using the metric of how many questions were asked and how much discussion we had. So you can argue whether or not that's valid, but that's how I did it. So I'm at least transparent about my methodology. So um, the key points, number one, uh, the role of guidelines or less evidence-based um, uh, pseudo guidelines, if you will, such as uh, ACP best practice advice and other examples that we heard of. Um, we, I heard uh, the idea that we need to get away from this paradigm of whether or not we should test to assuming that the information is there, what would you do with it? Um, the CPIC model, and again, others have talked about that particular model, but also the idea that we have to be sensitive to clinical scenarios, to clinical context. Uh, as was brought up by uh, Ned, um, uh, reflecting the work that uh, EGAP uh, has done. Um, practitioners, we've heard, look to their own specialty society for guidelines, but we've also heard about um, the opportunities that we may have when we can get uh, specialty societies to work together, and that's going to be more fully uh, explored in key point 10. Um, and so the question that I posed um, is, could there be some novel process that could overcome the parochial interests and policies of individual societies? And again, that may or may not be within scope of what we think we can reasonably accomplish, but it, it was an, a question I thought would be, was worth putting up there. We talked a lot about evidentiary standards. This is something that comes back. I think we've heard about evidence at all four of the genomic medicine meetings to this point, and I've expanded that a bit and collecting outcomes data to inform evidentiary gaps, um, which we'll also discuss in a bit later. So that's sort of the whole guideline point. Uh, the idea of focusing on the development of competencies as opposed to uh, just trying to teach the knowledge. Um, and I think one thing that I would identify as being uh, potentially a very useful outcome of this meeting would be if we could synthesize the different surveys that were done and you know, uh, publish something uh, that w here are cross-cutting issues. We have surveys from seven different professional societies, and here are the five things that every single one of them identified. I think that would be extremely powerful when combined with some of the uh, work that's been done through the uh, Secretary's Advisory Committee on Genetics, Health, and Society and their education publication. Uh, the SACDINX uh, education publication. We've got a lot of this, but it just really hasn't been well pulled together, and that would be a potential role, uh, an, uh, a tangible uh, output, a white paper of some type that could come out of this group. And the idea that we have to pay attention both to physicians and to allied health professionals. Um, we have to recognize that this needs to be bi-directional information flow. We've heard that from several different folks. Uh, we heard about the ASCO rapid learning system, uh, the way uh, the CRVR is intended to be used for this. Uh, but the, the idea that we need some, uh, something related to a safe harbor or a trusted broker uh, to manage this type of information collection and sharing uh, and that we really have to involve the patient perspective in this because ultimately if we don't capture uh, the patient, what the patients are interested in, uh, we will have missed a huge piece. Evidence, uh, the idea that genomics is a tool, I love that. Uh, we've never done a uh, RCT on creatinine-based dosing. I mean, I think in some ways that, that was a, a, a very interesting perspective that I hadn't heard before. Is RCT-level evidence needed? Um, uh, the role of uh, other types of evidence generation, comparative effectiveness, uh, pseudo-prospective trials. Um, the fact, again, relating back to what we talked about in number two, we'll have the data in hand. So it's, it's not a testing paradigm, 
uh, but it's how do we use data that we already have. And then uh, what was related in Bob's presentation, the concern about perfect information versus good enough information. The 70% effectiveness is better than not using the information at all because we're waiting for 100% effectiveness. And I think that's a very practical, uh, pragmatic argument that can be made. We heard about different tracks for genomic training to fill different needs that um, uh, as much as it pains me as a dysmorphologist to say, uh, not everybody needs to learn dysmorphology. Um, the maintenance, upgrading, and sustainability of proposed resources, this is an ongoing issue that we create cool things, either uh, through grant funding or something else, and it gets to the end of the funding, and then it just kind of goes away. And we've had many examples of things disappearing, although through dint of effort, we've had other things that have managed to find uh, sustainability, such as uh, OMIM and gene reviews and uh, what is now transformed in the genetic testing registry. Um, what are the incentives for the end users to actually learn about this? And we heard about uh, CME or its equivalents, maintenance of certification, reimbursement, uh, credentialing, which I think was a really interesting uh, uh, concept to emerge, and the liability issues. We heard about a lot of different materials that are available through a lot of different uh, professional societies. Would it be possible to aggregate all of these materials in one place, at least those materials that are uh, meant to be uh, publicly uh, consumable, and G2C2 is being a potential uh, place where this could be done. What can we do to make uh, increase the visibility of these resources? And uh, David uh, and I were talking at the break about how can we uh, lower barriers to accessing these resources, ideally within the context of care, and uh, a bridging technology right now might be using uh, an app. So in other words, you can link to up-to-date through a handheld device or something of that nature, because right now we may not have access to it in the electronic health record or through clinical decision support. It's not where we ultimately want to be, uh, but it's a bridging technology that can help uh, lower barriers to accessing information that's uh, of relevance. And then we heard about um, uh, this uh, concept of uh, the gene proposed of a society of societies. And, and to, in some ways, uh, th that exists. I mean, there, there is the um, American Council of Medical Specialties and other things, but it hasn't really um, targeted uh, some of the uh, important concepts that came up uh, today. Uh, one thing is done. So we, can, we have one tangible action item that we've already done, which is uh, professional society representation for the CRVR. I've declared that done, and there's a sign-up sheet, which is C. Aaron. So give Aaron your names if you want to participate, and then we, will, we can say we've done one thing even before we all leave. But I think there's the recognition, uh, as Bob Saul was saying, there are common and repetitive things that we all do, and we all bitch about the same things. It takes too long. It's too complicated. So can we, in fact, look at the things that we all do and that we're all trying to solve and in some ways uh, create a, a um, place where we can solve them together so we don't have to come up with one-offs? And uh, issues that had come up were issues around uh, direct-to-consumer, uh, some of the pharmacogenomic issues, and the guideline development. Again, whether or not that's something we'll feel competent to uh, address here, I don't know. So th those are sort of the 10 that, um, I didn't intend it to come out to be 10, it just sort of came out as 10, so this is not a Letterman ripoff. Um, so uh, I guess at, at this point then what we'd like to do is open the floor for discussion. Um, I would uh, certainly entertain uh, information about whether the prioritization um, is right or wrong, whether there are things that we completely missed that you think are important to represent on the list. Uh, enhancements, uh, or uh, best of all, um, practical uh, suggestions or solutions uh, for how we might move forward. A small so, addition to the number 10, it seems to me that um, one thing that I heard today is that um, the societies would benefit by sharing best practices. I mean, some of you have figured out some really interesting things, and I wonder whether some sort of mechanism can be put in place to actually share best practices about guidance and about educational activities. I would also make a suggestion, Mark, that it might be best for we introverts in the room if you ask everybody around the table to sort of chip in, because if we don't, the extroverts are going to take all the time. So 
it might be best to ask each of the professional societies to. Well, that wasn't something we talked about uh, from the group, but, but, but the point is well taken. Uh, however, given the total number of people in the room, I'm not going to take that suggestion uh, as a friendly amendment to what I'm going to do. But I will say, if you tend to be a shy person, get some powder milk biscuits and turn your microphone on. All right, that's a, that's a, a practical Midwestern solution to that problem. Joan, I think I saw your hand first. Uh, yeah, I, so um, I think another uh, important uh, thing that can come out of the meeting today um, is that um, education occurs or the implement all of this occurs implementation at the practice level and so what works in Geisinger is not necessarily going to work in a community health center in the Bronx and and what's going to happen in my internists um, office in Frederick Maryland mm -hmm. so all of all of the things that we've been talking about in the the different educational materials the approaches the tools the point of care versus more of a traditional CME approach. Um, all of that is going to have to be implemented for different approaches at different settings. And I think as, as groups start to generate that, what I had said earlier about practice-based evidence, about what works at the practice level, of having a forum to share those lessons learned so we know why does a point of care tool work in Geisinger because you have all of these blah, 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 versus why do we need a more traditional CME approach in another setting because they had a different problem with a different set of healthcare practitioners. So generating that information about the approaches that work in different settings in a form for, for everybody to share that I think would be really help advance uh, the, the science a lot. Great. I like that idea and I think the other thing to uh, mention in relation to that is that there is a trans NIH activity uh, related to dissemination and impl implementation science. And these uh, types of questions are scientific questions that can be approached uh, through funding mechanisms um, through that organization. Um, and there are a number of ICs that are uh, contributors to that dissemination and implementation group. Um, and as of uh, this year, NHGRI is one of the um, ICs that is actually contributing to that effort. So I think. Uh, adding uh, you know, engagement with uh, dissemination and implementation activities um, uh, at uh, either through NHGRI or through other mechanisms um, uh, to reflect best practices would be a good suggestion. Yeah, I want to make the point that it would be very helpful to make it easier to write guidelines across societies. So um, we actually wanted to do a guideline for pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma genetic testing and wanted to try to do it with ASCO um, and ACGME since obviously it seemed to cover both. But we started with ACMG and then we were told that, you know, we couldn't go back and forth once one that started one place, even though we hadn't done anything, we just wrote a proposal mm -hmm. that um, we couldn't go to the other. It was just became really difficult mm -hmm. and we got sort of lost in, an, uh, in a morass of trying to do it in more than one society. So um, I think that that would be really helpful to be able to do that with more facility. Yeah, so that would fall within the, the sort of the society of yeah. societies idea that there might be ways to, uh, to manage those types of issues because that's a recurring problem that we hear. Carrie. So we have, I think we have Donna and then um, Bill, did you have a comment? No, okay, and Pearl. Uh, how about Pearl was first then? Pearl and then Donna. Uh, just to add to you, number one on the guidelines, um, listening to the discussion around the table, I think we need to agree what we mean by guidelines in that I think uh, I'd be talking best practice guidelines that thou should or thou should consider or thou shalt. I and think the answer they, is yes. Okay, so but then the real thing. What I was trying to get at here was that there's a whole range of right. things that fall under the rubric of guidelines, and we heard several examples of those. And so I, I, I interpret this to mean everything that you know, falls under some type of a guidance. Okay, but um, I, I just think we need to pay attention to the tip of that iceberg in terms of how it might uh, push on coverage decision making as well as on liability for perhaps not doing it in certain settings and others. So I think there is a tip of that iceberg which carries some other baggage. Right, so what we could do, uh, Jean, just uh, to help me is uh, under D, just include um, uh, impact on reimbursement and impact on liability on 1D. Donna. Donna. 
Uh, just to build on the Society of CITES, uh, we're very enthusiastic about that approach, and I think there will be great synergy. Uh, we'd also, uh, I'll volunteer Bill and myself, in terms of the HAACC guidelines development, we've just gone through a rigorous methodology summit that took a full year looking at the IOM recommendations and really looking at how we can move forward with guidelines. And I think with the IOM's recommendations out there, if you want to call something a guideline building on what Pearl said, we really need to know what we're doing. And I think the society of societies could create some kind of process and we'd be happy to lend our expertise to that. Um, and I think also some of the stakeholders that I think will be important as we move forward and think about gathering evidence are the IT, the EMR, and the health systems, and probably the payers. Because right now we're working more on the scientific domain of the different phenotypic areas, mm -hmm. and I think we really will have to see how the EMR changes how we can collect information, how biorepositories can change what we're doing, and how payer systems may impact all of that. So I think having them at the table in our society of societies could really make something more comprehensive emerge from that. Thank you. And just to uh, sort of presage uh, coming attractions, um, one of the report outs um, will be a report of a meeting that we had with uh, engaging payers uh, with um, uh, industry and research and, and others to accomplish that. And we had a number of takeaways from uh, that meeting, uh, but this would be something that we could definitely add to that list. Uh, of things to consider, and we had a lot of enthusiasm and, and willingness to uh, participate uh, from, uh, from those folks. I would just add that um, there's some risk that we might duplicate efforts that have been undertaken already, and, and it's natural that we would. A fair bit of this has been accomplished within societies because a guideline is not a guideline is not a guideline. When we started to write the um, cancer link, we were immediately confronted by the level one, level two, level three evidence, the no evidence at all. And so we have um, used standards from, broadly from medicine, to write guidelines, guidance, standards of practice, you, you know, typical care, and then begin to feed back against them and benchmark. And there are procedures even, I forget the uh, name, it starts with a D, there's a procedure for basically taking minimal data sets uh, and having groups of experts reach Delphi. consensus. What's it called? Delphi. Delphi, right. So I think that all that has been somewhat done already. Right. The other thing that I would just point out about society uh, of societies, pragmatism and, and expense being what they are, it didn't take us very long to start to uh, vote formally within ASCO, for example, to endorse Ontario guidelines. Yeah. Because they did the work already. We look at them, yeah. done. Yeah. And, and so there, a lot of that process maybe one could very efficiently get through. That. Yeah. And I think that the intent of that would not be to, as you say, you know, go back and do it all over again, but to really uh, assemble um, uh, the best practices so you could envision in a society of societies that there would be, you know, a reconciliation group that would look at uh, evidentiary ranking and that there would be another group that would look at, um, um, uh, you know, uh, methodologies to be employed where there's not... Um, uh, certain levels of evidence or, or these types of things. So. The, the only point I'll just make in this discussion is it's not a static creation. And one of the things that we will have to grapple with is how you provide some sort of meaningful feedback against your guidelines, especially when they're not at the highest level of evidence. Right. Because you need to test them going forward to see if they're legitimate or not. This is real effort. Right. And that's directional flow. That we have to get the information back somehow, um, and that was also a topic that was discussed at the payer meeting, uh, which is the idea that, you know, do, you know, payers have a stake in terms of improving care as well. So can we use novel payment methodologies, um, and some of which have been employed, for instance, the uh, CMS decision to do coverage with evidence development related to pharmacogenomic testing for warfarin to try and answer the question about whether you should do it or not. Now, that you know, one could argue that that process didn't necessarily result in the best trial, but at least it's an honest effort to try and do those sorts of things. So yeah, I think that that's, uh, that that's important. Rex. Uh, well, I'll just add, add to that, that one of the things that's been explicit in all of the discussions of the, whatever we're calling it, CRVR uh, right now, is that evidence changes over time, right? And so we need to be able to understand how a variant that today doesn't meet a criteria 
might in a year and a half meet the, a different set of criteria. So there needs to be uh, an explicit process built into whatever there is to make sure that um, there's a, a reasonable review of the evidence behind any given data, uh, give it any given um, guideline, because that is not a static thing itself. So yeah, my recollection was that that uh, specific point was um, uh, mentioned in the RFA that there has to be some um, uh, attention to that um, uh, that very point, uh, which again gets back to the getting information back out. Uh, because the other issue we're going to have is that you know even if the you know the world as a whole has decided that evidence is not sufficient to move something into practice, there will be certain enthusiasts or early adopters that will move it into practice. And if we can learn by that uh, pilot experience, then that will be, and then we can aggregate that information. That would be useful. So I think I saw Bill and someone else on this side. But Bill, go ahead. Uh, along the same lines of guidelines and, and uh, documents. I would propose also putting in that same category appropriate use criteria. Okay. And the reason for it, it has a certain methodology. And let me share that with you because I think it's very attractive. If a guideline is put only by a geneticist to push a certain you know, testing, whatever it is, there is apparent conflict because you're trying to push and you're the expert on it. The nice thing about the appropriate use criteria They've been developed, I think, in 1999 by RAND and UCLA, and then they used the modified Delphi methodology. There is a technical panel, let's say here, genetics expert, but ultimately the, the scoring panel has multiple stakeholders, has clinicians, has experts in the field, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that methodology lends itself to more scrutiny as well as more acceptance from the outside. Yes. I'm changing the topic, and I don't want to do that if there's still more comments on no, guidelines. No, I, I think that I think that's fine. Okay, all right. I'm just going to go back a little bit to the genetics education track, and one thing, Mark, you had mentioned was um, training educate educators, genetic educators, possibly. Is that correct? Uh, I had mentioned the idea that perhaps a, an, another class of uh, providers uh, that has a certain level of genetics training, but not to the level of a genetic counselor or a medical geneticist. Right. Yeah, I propose that. And one thing I would, and I, I think we should definitely look at a lot of different possibilities. And one thing I would also propose is to think about challenging the current program directors. Um, there's an association of genetic counseling program directors, and also ABGC and the new accreditation um, ACGC to also think about how we can train more genetic counselors if that's something we think is necessary. Um, you know, Gail spoke to earlier about how residency programs in genetics aren't full, but 100% of our slots in genetic counseling training programs are full with still highly qualified applicants that we can't get in, we can't fit into current training programs. So how can we expand that, what resources are necessary, and maybe asking some of those questions might be worthwhile. Thank you. Yes, Gail. Just one comment I'm sorry, on not item. Gail, Jean. Sorry, Jean Jenkins. Um, just one item under two in terms of competencies. Just so you're aware, there are nurse uh, competencies, mm -hmm. there are physician assistant competencies, and the pharmacists just uh, um, are endorsing their competencies soon to be released. And then there's also nichepeg.org, which has general health care provider competencies listed as well. So those might be templates or ideas mm -hmm. for consideration. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, although. Um, uh, and this will not shock Joan because she's heard me say it in a number uh, of times, that uh, many of those are, are much more knowledge than they are competencies, I think, at the present time. But I think revisiting that, and I'll let you have a, have a rebuttal to that. No, no, I, no I, I agree with you. I think that's where my comment about it, it happens, the implementation piece. It's yeah. like in that particular setting, what's the gap there yeah. and what's the the skill that's needed to close that gap, and the knowledge is only what supports it. And, and so I agree. I agree with you. Yeah. Pearl. Uh, a comment and a question. This is on 1D. I would like that one a lot, since that's where I was before. But um, collecting outcome data, is there anything being done at a trans-NIH level regarding this? Because it's not just genetics that needs outcome data. And I fear that the way we're going 
um, with our sort of siloed electronic medical records, HIPAA. I mean, there's so many anti-sharing situations going on, whereas I think this is something that would be, I think, good to hold hands on. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll refer to my, my colleagues at other institutes. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any efforts in that realm, or any of you? Sounds like a good data science project. Ooh. So what Ooh. is a data science project? The science, science of the You've got the interim director sitting right next to you. No, I think I think it's the logistics of sharing. Um, Collect, so I think it is the logistics of. I mean, I think you know, right now everybody and his brother has a different electronic medical record system that they are. They, you know, there may be a common vendor, but we're all changing it for our own place, which we're so unique, yeah. you know. Um, <laughs> and and then add that to that onto that also just issues of not only HIPAA but a patchwork quilt of state laws regarding what you can and can't share without specific consent. Um, and yet, we need outcome data. I would think every other area of medical research needs outcome data. Um, so rather than us owning this, I'm trying to find yeah, and, a and rich partner. Yeah, and there's clearly there are other federal agencies. I mean, the FDA is very interested in collecting post-market data because they recognize that the drug approval process does not generate adequate amounts of information to identify rare uh, and significant uh, medical side effects. Uh, the whole point, I think, to some degree of uh, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute that was created as part of the Affordable Care Act is the idea that we have to uh, be able to uh, get at outcomes. AHRQ has certainly done some work. So this is an, uh, an area that a lot of people have uh, been talking about. And, and so in some ways that uh, implies that the solutions are not uh, readily apparent. And so uh, the question then uh, really comes to um, the scope. In other words, could we, through the CRVR or some other mechanism, actually address the delimited issue of collecting information relating to genetic variants, in which case that would be a good thing, uh, recognizing we can't solve all of the problems. And, and that's the thing I always get nervous about is that almost anything we talk about, whether it's privacy or discrimination or access, ultimately scales back to a problem inherent in our healthcare delivery system. And if we take that on, then we will definitely not get anywhere. So I think that's the, that's the only tension that I would see is, is while there's opportunities for partnership there, we have to do it uh, being cognizant of the fact that we ultimately could try and eat a whole elephant. Yeah, but one of, the, one of the whole issues, I think, of this big data initiative, uh, this data science initiative, is there are technical tools that can be deployed to uh, anonymize and make mm -hmm. sure that, you know, to the extent that people, and, and policy tools that can be applied to say you can't, you're not allowed to re-identify, you agree not to re-identify. So, you know, I think big data is only big data to the extent that it's not all sitting in separate silos. And so a federated approach to think about how to bring important key elements of data and integrate them, I think, is an is a important target for the big data initiative. Yeah. Good. Um, Jeff. So one thing that I didn't hear mentioned today um, is the use of genetics as a training tool in the classroom. Um, you know, it's a, still a handful of programs, but nursing, medical students, grad, grad, um, uh, fellows, and, uh, and even uh, postgraduate courses and have used genetics as, uh, as a means to try to um, uh, and train physicians and providers in, uh, you know, what, what a genetic test really is. And, and I guess the question is, um, you know, is there an opportunity for us to learn from those efforts and uh, maybe guide them a little bit or to understand where they might be useful? Maybe that comes under one of your educational initiatives or the Society of Societies, or I don't know if any of the professional organizations have had direct contact with those or have a comment on it. Do you have a specific example that we could perhaps uh, uh, reference? Well, the, um, at Stanford, there's a uh, medical school. Medical, uh, medical students are given the option to get their some SNPs used as part of their training. Uh, there's the BIDMC, I think, pathology residence right. course that uh, has also offered this. Uh, Which actually our, just, uh, um, they were just awarded a large uh, grant, I think, to, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken. 
um, uh, to look at that at that more broadly across. Uh, but, it but it won't include the SNP testing from Navigenics, which is what they did for their residents, for paid their for residents. by the department. Okay, and I, I think Ohio is State question is, is also. What, there are several. Yeah. These are ground up, obviously, initiatives. Um, a, 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 um, aimed at training health professionals, and I, I think it deserves at least a place on our agenda to understand and evaluate its okay. usefulness or not. So, it's, or, or in some ways, it, it's even a, a um, in some ways, it's a personalization. So, in other words, uh, personal experience with genetic information. Um, uh, yeah, understanding what it means to you. Okay. Yes. Just one follow-up comment to that. There was a um, session at the last ASHAG meeting uh, just around that where a number of, of uh, groups who have uh, implemented this in their uh, various medical schools had shared their experiences about the different approaches that they took and why. So that would be a place to start to sort of get that information. Um, I want to uh, maybe put a couple people on the spot. Oh, you, you can decline to accept being put on the spot. Uh, but uh, in the course of the meeting today, there were some emails that were kind of flying around, um, particularly from some of the NHGRI folks, about certain things that were being discussed. And um, it may or may not, uh, you may, may or may not feel comfortable sharing uh, in this group some of the uh, conversations about uh, the education group uh, at NHGRI and your reaction to what we've been talking about or policy in your reaction to what we're talking about, but um, if you have some things that uh, you've heard uh, that you would like to relate initiatives to or opportunities about, uh, I, I would certainly entertain those. Or you can say, out of bounds. Yeah, well, I'm not sure what you're talking about, so, so <laughs> maybe, maybe my colleagues are, are aware. Uh, so. uh -huh. I, I guess one thing I would mention is that, for example, uh, do we need to go to like Medicare and Medicaid and talk to them about genetics? For example, a test came out with the RNA for 21 and Medicare is approved to do it. FDA hasn't and if I were to look at it seriously, I have to say I have a hard time finding why they should. But obviously these are providers of a large number of our population and I think that are they really educated to it and maybe certainly if a a robust representative from this uh, conglomerate today were to approach them, I think it would be meaningful. Well, actually, I can tell you that we've had engagement with um, at least some representatives from uh, CMS uh, that attended actually uh, one of these genomic medicine meetings and presented and also uh, 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 presented uh, uh, participated in the payer meeting where they talked about the uh, coverage with evidence development. So we have some engagement. The challenge, of course, with dealing with something like CMS is that uh, one representative, um, you know, cannot the entire organization represent. And so, uh, you know, uh, the, the, how that gets communicated back and how that filters down in terms of overall coverage policy and that is, is uh, uh, to some degree problematic. But we certainly have um, reached out and engaged and we recognize that they do, in fact, uh, provide um, uh, coverage uh, that ultimately could impact um, a utilization of some of the things that we're talking about. Well, I can just say as a, a I mean, as a follow-up, um, I, I did have a follow-up meeting uh, with WellPoint uh, after our last payer meeting, and, and they're actually very willing to continue to be engaged and actually provide data of a sort that I don't think we've had access to before in terms of how, how many cases they support and how much money they spend on genetic testing and a variety of other things, which I think will be very useful for us to inform this activity as we go forward. Yeah, and there have been other payers that have been uh, willing to uh, um, uh, show us at least aggregate numbers, um, uh, such as uh, United Healthcare, uh, not in a NHGRI. Well, actually, it was co sponsored, I think, with uh, uh, CTMP, um, uh, where there was some, uh, their uh, white paper on uh, genetic utilization was presented. So, I, so we do have some good engagement. I think they're, they're interested. I can tell you that their perspective is um, they're less interested in the evolutionary approach that we've talked about. They're really looking, they, they recognize uh, in terms of the utilization curve and the cost curve 
that they need something to dramatically alter uh, the trajectory. And in some ways, they're saying, if you can provide us with something that's going to dramatically alter, as opposed to being one more thing that's added on. So that's the, the takeaway message there, is don't be one more cool thing that's just going to add more cost and not improve outcomes. So there, I think that was their message to us, is that you really have to think about you know, how you're addressing the value equation. Yes. Uh, so this is sort of going back to the um, question you asked in HGRI about um, you know different projects that they are, are involved in and possible funding opportunities. But I wanted to just point out, and maybe some people saw this a couple of weeks ago, the AMA announced that uh, it would be funding eight to twelve medical schools um, that are willing to um, submit applications and undergo a pretty extensive um, change in the way that. Um, or, or, or at least proposed pilot um, type changes in the way that medical education is is undertaken. And so I just wanted to point out, the, the RFP is online if anybody is interested in seeing it, and I would certainly encourage any of you who have that decision-making power at a medical school to, um, to read through this RFP. But one of the, um, the uh, examples that is written here in the RFP about the types of innovations that the, um, com the granting committee is going to be looking at says improvements and innovations in training related to a whole bunch of things, and one of them is genomic health. And so this is, you know, hopefully the fact that it is written into the RFP will encourage um, some of these medical schools to think about that and incorporate that into some of their proposals. So. We're hoping, I, I have nothing to do with the, the um, group that put out this RFP, RFP other than chatting with them in the halls every once in a while, but, um, but I, I do talk with them and I hope that this um, will be something that's incorporated in many of the proposals that they end up getting. Great, thank you. I might note that, that in, in terms of RFAs and other things that are, that are sort of pending, we, we will have a discussion of those, those tomorrow. So, um, so there was a plan for, for NHGRI to talk about kind of the, the ongoing genomic medicine activities that we have. We thought we would focus on the professional yeah. societies today. Ned. So I don't know how far we were getting away from number one to the rest of the list, but since it's still up there and it relates to evidentiary standards, <clears throat> I think uh, it is critical that we figure out a standard approach or framework to other evidentiary standards that could be used to inform clinical guidelines other than a randomized controlled trial. The recognition is that no matter what you do, you introduce uh, uncertainty or, if you will, you increase your risk of being wrong. Uh, so back to an issue, uh, a, a phrase that was used earlier, we can all agree on the facts, but we take the same facts or the same evidence and can create really different um, professional guidelines that vary on this basis of when is evidence good enough to say go ahead and do it. So I think if we can ad admit that, it might help structure the, the decision making around what evidence other than RCTs can be used to drive a you should do it type of guideline um, and just recognize that there's a risk of being wrong. Then a framework that says, okay, if we are wrong, you know, what is the potential harm out there? So if your risk of being wrong is moderate but your risk of doing harm is low, you could actually say let's get some experience with this particular approach, reporting this result or acting on this uh, issue and then fill in the evidence gap going forward. I think as, as I've talked to other people, then you have to have the evidence, the coverage with evidence deliver, uh, uh, development discipline to say, once we know something doesn't work, we're going to stop paying for it. And I, you know, we, we heard the, the digoxin uh, uh, <laughs> example earlier. We used a lot of digitalis before we actually did the RCTs. And to be honest, we used a lot of digitalis after we did the RCTs <laughs> because the diffusion of information yeah. to not do something travels slowly as well. So I think managing that piece is really important. Mm -hmm. And then I always ask people who are doing guidelines to always think about the comparison with usual clinical care because we've developed the biochemical and the pathophysiologic pharmacologic approach to medicine over a number of years supported by science in the randomized control trial. 
And while uh, we're better in some areas than others, we're actually pretty good in a lot of areas. And so we should always be thinking about the marginal benefits. What additional clinical health outcomes do we gain versus the marginal costs and risks? And as long as we always keep those in mind, I think we can create these slightly less certain guidelines with evidence development that we're disciplined to fill in the gaps moving forward and improving science. And I think that's the framework that the guidelines that could be existing between the, the group of professional groups should kind of look at in moving forward. So to um, um, maybe put a different spin in terms of what it is you're saying, um, what, the way I would uh, capture that is to say we've got a nearly infinite number of things that we could potentially choose to do guidelines about. If we had some sort of a framework by which we could prioritize um, which things are uh, more likely to bene be beneficial and less harmful using some other types of criteria than are currently used, then we could prioritize creation of, of uh, that and also prioritize um, uh, what we really want to collect evidence uh, around rather than just you know, letting it uh, happen in a stochastic way. And so whoever chooses to do something contribute to evidence, that's what we get, but it may not be what we're particularly interested in. Yeah, I think that's good. Alan. Um, I have two comments uh, about uh, surveys and guidelines, I guess. Um, I, I thought the survey data that was presented today was really informative. But on the other hand, um, in, uh, none of the surveys really presented any benchmarks to know <clears throat> what to compare this data to. And I think that would be very important if a white paper is going to be written so that uh, uh, the data is interpretable. To me, it seemed like, well, yeah, docs need more education in genetics, but maybe docs need more education with regard to how to diagnose a thyroid nodule or something like that. So um, uh, I think we need that, that benchmark. Um, the second, uh, with getting to guidelines and surveys, is um, <clears throat> I wonder whether guidelines drafted by a society of societies um, would be um, taken the same way by a, uh, an individual member of a society in terms of how they would interpret those guidelines and potentially implement them. Uh, we all tend to be married to our specific mm -hmm. memberships, and I'm just not sure that guidelines drafted by um, a conglomerate of societies would be interpreted the same way by uh, physicians in the trenches who are actually going to decide whether they're going to implement or not. Uh, that would be a good survey question to yeah. ask. Yeah, and I think that that's, a, you know, that's a, a fair point, although I think inherent in the comments was that um, th whatever this uh, hypothetical process would be, um, whatever societies contributed to it will ultimately then present that as this is our, so there would be an endorsement process or something where you would, you know, each of the representative societies that participated in the creation of that guideline would say, yes, ACMG, ACOG, AHA, we're all, we all hold this as our guideline, um, which is one of the reasons why it's such a problem to do joint guidelines because we have these processes that are very different. Um, but uh, that was at least the way I was taking it. But uh, there would be another model, which would be the idea that you'd have um, this, uh, this Uber uh, society that would create its own guidelines that, you know, um, the individual societies could choose or, uh, to or not to uh, endorse. And I think in that case, th that question becomes um, uh, particularly relevant. Yeah, it took about 30 years to agree on a diagnosis for gestational diabetes between the ADA and the, uh, so that's just one example. Yeah. <laughs> And it's usually not the big stuff that we disagree on. It's usually the little stuff, but it, it you know, it's that asymptote where, you know, it, it's trying to approach the speed of light where, you know, you have to throw more and more energy and you never really get there. And, and so again, you know, in the quality improvement lexicon, it's perfect being the enemy of good enough. And as a result, we just create more work and we have less product, um, whereas we could probably do more good if we just gave up on some of the, 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 the smaller stuff. But yeah, Mary? I guess to expand a little bit on these points about um, in terms of collecting outcome data, how important is the problem, what's the downside of implementing a guideline um, related also to our earlier conversations about 
Um, we, we don't insist on having outcome data that dosing many drugs based on serum creatinine improves outcomes. And we continue to apply this genetic exception, exceptionalism to ourselves. So I think we should also prioritize and identify those applications of genomic medicine and genetic testing where it's not worth spending our precious tax dollars that we're all fighting for to get our grant money on something that's more or less a no-brainer. Yeah. And that we should also be willing to say sometimes we shouldn't collect outcome data because I believe collecting outcome data is one of the most complex exercises there is, right? I mean, is this not what eMERGE spends all of its efforts doing is figuring out how to take highly sophisticated people with electronic health records and getting useful information out of it? And it's a huge effort from a lot of smart people. So it's extremely expensive to collect outcome data which also means collecting all the treatment information data, which is extremely complex in order to understand how to interpret your outcome data. So a lot of times people throw up, let's, let's compare outcomes as if that's the easiest thing in the world to do when it's the hardest and the most expensive and the most complex things to do. So let's sometimes be satisfied with implementing and moving on. Yeah. And I think that, you know, in pharmacogenomics, there are clear examples. I mean, you take a back of ear. It's an adverse event. It's highly predicted with a single SNP. You've got alternative medications. You know, you don't need to do an outcome study on that. You just say, don't give the people that have the SNP a back of ear. Use another antiretroviral. Um, the challenge sometimes is, is the balance of, and we've had this conversation before, the balance between adverse events and efficacy. Because in some of the conditions, uh, some of the drugs, uh, gene pairs we're talking about, there's not only impact on increasing adverse events, but the adverse event is a consequence also of, an, of a treatment target. And so uh, by reducing adverse events, you might in fact also reduce efficacy. And, and that's where I think you know, measuring outcomes becomes uh, a much more important uh, activity. But you're right, rather than just applying the rubric to say we have to uh, collect outcomes, we say we're only going to collect outcomes in this scenario. We're not going to collect outcomes in these scenarios. And that's, I think, gets back to what Ned was talking about in terms of defining that framework up front in terms of what it is you really need to answer the question. What's the consequences of not giving someone a back of ear when you have a bunch of alternative medications? It's extremely low. And so you can tolerate being, you know, somewhat wrong, even though in that particular case we're not wrong. So. Uh, Bill, I think you were first and then Mike. I just want to caution regarding guidelines of rediscovering the wheel a bit. Uh, the reason for it is IOM just came out this past year with recommendations of how to even refine them further. So I think that this is the, really the guide for all of us. Where you see a lot of uh, variability, I would say, is going beyond guidelines. Expert consensus documents, maybe a appropriate news use criteria, position papers, health policy papers, uh, regarding uh, a certain issue here and there. But I would recommend that, that we really uphold, uh, in the vast majority, the IOM recommendations, which are quite restrictive. And if you look at our European colleagues, I mean, they look at us and you know, wow, you, you are, uh, you're quite restrictive going there. But th this is really the, the common nomenclature for us, if it is a guideline, a guideline has something meaningful by itself. It has a certain methodology, it's quite rigorous, it has a systematic review, it has so many other things that go into it. Uh, so I, I would encourage this group to, to take this you know, recommendation as really the recommendation for it. Right, and I, I would just say that, you know, again, I don't think we've been rigorous about the semantic use of the term guideline here. I think we're using it in a much more generic sense, and so I think uh, I, I think you're, uh, for, for what we would truly characterize as a guideline as defined by IOM, I would completely agree with you, but we have all of these other things that, you know, based on frameworks or whatever, we may determine are more appropriate to use as opposed to a guideline, in which case then we probably do have some creation to do in terms of saying, well, what would be the appropriate way to approach that? So that would be the only comment I would make to clarify that. So. Just to change the topic a bit, could we discuss a bit the so the concept of society of societies, like a, a fund of funds? Be before I, I do that, uh, Mike, did you have a, a comment specific to guidelines? I don't want to. I didn't want to derail that. Yeah, in the uh, guideline area, I think that something that would be really useful uh, to clinicians 
and a real need is if we extend uh, Mary's CPIC model. Uh, we are going to be faced with a situation where lots of people are going to have genetic results uh, in patients that, uh, that need to have them put into perspective. Uh, Mark, you've been working and a lot of people have on the, uh, the idea of returning the incidental or secondary findings from genomes. I mean, this whole notion of, you know, what to do with a BRCA mutation in someone who has no family history and no prior probability. Um, if we could uh, focus the, some of the energies of people in this room on what to do with results in those situations, because that's going to be the real frontline battle that uh, providers are going to have to face of what to do with this data. Okay. Thanks. So now we'll come back. Maybe should we call it, um, for those of us that are old enough, we can call it the Great Society. Right? Uh, <laughs> channel LBJ here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. I, I just want us to clarify, because I don't know if this was a previous discussion or not, regarding society of societies, as to what do, one, what do we mean by that? And uh, uh, what are some of the, you know, uh, guidelines for, for, that, for that concept, and uh, besides certainly solidifying the science, some of the processes that we have together. What, what do you guys have in mind? Well, I think that the, the, what, what I'm reflecting here is that this, is, this concept sort of emerged from the uh, presentations and from the discussion. And so uh, it's really more to represent sort of a straw man concept um, that has, you know, little, if anything, beneath it in terms of what it should really uh, look like or what it should do. And so it's really more of a trial balloon to say to people around the room, um, is this um, a concept that has enough value to it that we should begin to drill down and explore what would be the conditions and what would be the work of this uh, proposed society of societies, one. And number two, is that really work that this group in the context of genomic implementation thinks would be valuable or would the uh, output be in our summary, we say th this was a clear problem that was identified and um, we don't think it's our problem to fix, but we would hold it up to the society representatives to perhaps take it further. That, that's how I would characterize how it arose and, and what we're now kind of deciding what to do with. So Mark, let me take a crack at a little bit of that. It does seem to me that um, it would function as a clearinghouse in a way, just as today we've heard a lot of different approaches to similar problems. A body like that might keep track of technological advances. They might keep track of what's coming out of the clinical variant thing. It might, in fact, ask professional societies or recommend to professional societies, some of whose representatives sit on it, that this is, seems like something that you ought to look into. Why don't you do it? It seems to me for a society of societies or whatever we want to call it uh, to impose itself on an existing professional society is silly. I mean, I don't think anybody would want to do that. But I do think um, I heard around this table today a lot of things that I had never heard of people doing. And uh, sharing those best practices, it seems to me, would be a useful thing to do if that's the only thing that it does. So anyway, that's the general idea, I think. Hey. Rex. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not a fan of the term society of societies because I think it implies something that we're really not intending to imply here. Um, you know, society of societies would suggest that there's some reach through to the individual members of that society, and, and I don't think that's what we're talking about here. I think, you know, what we're really talking about, and I think it really drew, it grew out of the CRVR, I can never get the acronym quite right, but um, out of the discussion that we should have a place where people could get together and coordinate. And that's a very, coordinating is a very different activity from implying something about society. So I would say we should not use the term society societies and maybe talk about a coordinating group of societies for genomic medicine or some. Or a coordinate, coordinating committee, perhaps. Okay. I, I would go along with that. I think either a coordinating group, working group, task okay. force, whichever way, because, you know, society has other implications, yeah. but I think. The essence of what, Gene, what you just mentioned is, is really what came uh, out loud today is there's so much to share and coordinate and synchronize among various societies. Nancy, I think you were next. Um, I, 
you might want to call it an advisory group. I don't know. But I, I think this also means you'd have to, I mean, I, when I think about this for ACOG, I mean, it would mean that somebody would have to talk to some very high level people to even get them on board, um, as opposed to going through our committees, right? I mean, because I, uh, I don't know. I guess I can just envision all the political yeah. ramifications of this. So yeah. it's, it's a, it's a, it's you know, a wonderful. Uh, right. Uh, as Yogi Berra once said, in theory, theory is mm -hmm. better than practice, and practice it ain't. So this is uh, yeah. something that is theoretically attractive, but right. as you say, the operationalizing it through the right. existing society structures uh, um, is potentially it's problematic. Tough. I mean, I guess I would view it as something. I mean, I, I think it's a great idea. I'm, I'm not saying it's not, but I think this is about sort of. It, uh, advice and support and broadening mm -hmm. knowledge yeah. and sharing goals and stuff, but I, as opposed to any kind of society of societies, but yeah. some sort of advisory group. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I think we got to get rid of yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but somewhere where somebody goes to some very high level person to kind of bring that up. Yeah. We'll call it, it the coalition of the willing and, accept, it, and, 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 yeah. and assume the same success. I mean, all um, of these have executive boards, right? It's an executive board issue, really. Right. Yes. I think rather than, than focusing on, on names, um, what would be very helpful for us to learn from the society members who are here, some of whom are at very high levels, um, is, is how you would want to interact with us and with the, with the other groups in, in terms of either giving suggestions or recommendations to your membership collectively to us or to, or to others. We do have to be a little bit careful about establishing federal advisory groups, which this would not be. Um, but, but it would be very helpful. I, I liked Jean's idea of maybe, you know, putting the, the various societies on the spot who are around the, around the table and just asking you to, to comment on, on what your, your group would like to do and, and how you'd like to be involved. Um, so maybe if one of you wants okay. to. Terry, so I would like to say one thing before we get probably worried about the names and what have you. But I, I think it would be a mistake if we didn't, whether it's these 10 points or something watered down or otherwise enhanced, you know, to ask all the societies to publish that page in all of their flagship journals. I think that would have a tremendous effect for us then as individual societies to move forward. Uh, I certainly don't like uh, another committee because Committees have a life of their own if they don't achieve things. And the famous quote is that, you know, very few people on a committee does anything, uh, but they often stop many people from doing anything. <laughs> and, and I always remember, you know, look back about 2,000 years ago, a guy got together to think about he should go down and transform the spiritual system on Earth. And the three of them got together, but they sent one. Then he got 12 disciples and were wondering about ever since what's right or wrong. So I don't think society should be good about it. <laughs> but I do think we should have something out in the journals. And I think asking the people from the various societies what you can publish that one page would be good inf ammunition for all of us to use for our individual. Yes. Oh, again, I mean, I understand some of the concerns, but to me this seems um, relatively apolitical. We frequently collaborate to get lots of things done, and most of the larger societies, I, and I'll speak for ASCO, would be very welcoming of somebody just saying, here are the rules, here's the playing ground, and we would contribute to it and we would respond to it. It's a whole lot better than everybody setting up a, um, a local shop to try to resolve the same problems again. So I, I, I don't think we'd have any hesitation at all about supporting this in whatever way we could. I would say I wouldn't call it a society of societies because it's... <laughs> right, it's so just have, a little working group, that's yeah, all. Okay, so we have, have Donna and I think Bill. So I really won't get stuck on the name either, but because um, I recognize there's a lot of juice in that conversation. But from the perspective of the American Heart Association, I think for me, I'm still struggling with what the it is that we're trying to solve by all coming together. So I'll try to articulate what I think the it is. And I think we came here to evaluate and assess the level of education needed to create a workforce in the health arena that can accommodate genomic medicine. And the second piece is how we could move genomic medicine translatable down into the trenches where people are working. So assuming those are our two objectives, and I could be wrong, but assuming that, I would think this group would want to come together and create one common 
educational platform targeted at the various health delivery systems that we have, and that then we could also define what are the minimal pieces required to develop a guideline or a performance measure or something else that would allow us to move into that translational space. So that's what I think the it is and what we, the American Heart Association, would want to contribute to. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, that's reasonable. And again, I think the, um, the risk is to try and over-define uh, at a very granular level um, you know, what that would be, but you know, keeping it a relatively higher concept, which is to say the, these are things, and we've heard in all the presentations from the different groups today, you all had the same sorts of things teed up in terms of you know, we have to get our people ready you know, for genetics and genomics and, and you know, the, the needs assessments kind of show the same thing. So uh, rather than do what we usually do, which is we all go off and do our own thing, um, can we in fact do that together, uh, achieve some efficiencies of scale, some consistency, um, but then let the, you know, the, the group, um, uh, you know, in some ways define how they want to actually um, uh, create uh, actionable uh, output related to that. That's how I would kind of see it. Um, Wolfgang, I think. Yeah, I was just uh, thinking about the terms that are being thrown around and what we're trying to achieve. So um, it's said genomics, genetics, genomics, uh, which is a discipline, uh, and then genomics medicine, which enlarges this. And I thought, you know, what is all similar or common to all these societies and what we want to do, well, genetics, genomics, but also medical informatics. It's also ethics. It's also economics, et cetera. So, um, one has the tendency to expand the role of what one wants to do, uh, and then all of a sudden there are all these other uh, stakeholders that do the same thing. Uh, so I, I'm not clear now whether we're fighting for or, uh, you know, activating for genomic medicine. That means we want to change medicine as a whole, or whether we look specifically at genomics, and uh, some of the definitions are not clear in my mind anymore. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's natural at this point, because I think what we're really dealing with are, uh, you know, some concepts that have been articulated, but again, those concepts in some ways are going to mean different things to different people, and I don't think, I can guarantee you, having done a few of these before, that with 80 people in the room, we will not achieve consensus on what everything uh, is to be done. But I think if we can achieve the idea that there's a group of folks that are really activated and want to work together on this, one of the tasks would be to define the scope of what it is uh, that will be done. I think that would be a reasonable output. One of the things I was struck by as I listened to everyone speaking is that many of us have webinars or teaching courses online and just even for all the different specialty practices for pathology, almost all of those would be relevant in, in one way or another. And having all those resources in one place. You know, yeah, number, and, number nine here, yeah. where again, I think that, that would, that's something that I would see as being you know, um, very doable. Recognizing that not all the um, resources that are created within a professional society are meant for public yeah. consumption. Um, but those that are, uh, it would seem that either whether it's a repository of links or the materials themselves, that would be a relatively easy thing to do and that there potentially could be um, uh, resources within uh, genome or within the NIH more broadly that could, you know, serve as the uh, aggregator. Uh, again, that would be something that would seem to be very doable. So it's good to highlight that. We tend to like to focus on the really hard things and forget that sometimes they're really easy things that we can, uh, uh, that we can do quickly. So, so following then on, on comments that we've already heard from, from at least uh, you know, some of the ASCO and the, and the AHA reps, I think, Bill, um, maybe you, you might want to comment from, uh, uh, from the ACC. We also have uh, our, our pediatric friends, I think, still here, yes, yeah, um, and, and others. So, so Bill, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, um, I like this forum. I think this forum has shown us that uh, all of us face challenges uh, in the area of, of genomics. And, uh, and there are tremendous opportunities that conceivably we can learn from each other. I think 
Mark, you, you, uh, you highlighted the, quite a few of the commonalities here and, and things. So uh, I think this forum should not be there only for one time. And, uh, but from this meeting should come out some uh, summary of uh, at least the things that we've shared. So going back to uh, quite a few of the surveys actually highlighted the opportunities and the challenges. And I think, I mean, this is the pathway in a way to try to improve that. And it is education uh, from, from medical school, if it is not on the curriculum, and this is something that we could do something together, to the training programs. Uh, and, uh, and I believe also that education will always have different forms, be it webinars, CME, et cetera, because individuals you know, interact and engage in different ways throughout. But um, since each one of our specialties are dealing with uh, disease entities that have some genetic basis, some of them more highlighted than others, some uh, more mature from understanding pathophysiology, et cetera, and application. And we're not able to really penetrate and affect that very well, be it because of knowledge or who to refer or how to embed individuals. And uh, also payment reform and CMS I really think here there is an opportunity to highlight with some commonalities on how to, how to address this. Now, each one of us in their own you know, milieu will have to decide what to do because mm -hmm. the diseases are different. For pathology is different, for cancer is different, for cardiovascular disease is different. But there is enough commonalities at least to come up with something that this is on the radar screen, it is an issue. And these are at least some solutions to take us there. Everything is evolving, and our ways of, of educating and engaging individuals is evolving. And believe it or not, patients need to get involved here. You know, we have a website for patients, and we're going to put some genetic material where it, where it makes sense for when there is the discussion between the healthcare professional and the patient, that can come to the radar screen. Yeah, Bob. Um, the, obviously, I cannot speak for the American Academy of Pediatrics. I'm merely a representative, but I think I can speak to the fact that we, uh, we very much uh, welcome collaboration both ways, the ability for somebody like me to come to this meeting and the ability for other members of other professional organizations in the government to come to our meetings. We have representatives from the NIH and other folks like that that come to our Committee on Genetics in addition to the uh, representative from the American College of OBGYN. So we're very much uh, a part of that. Um, at the same time, I think the American Academy of Pediatrics, and like most professional organizations that deals with a specific constituency, is very protective of that constituency and wants to make sure they're doing the right thing by that constituency because that's where their money comes from is, is those folks. So it has to be uh, deal with and, uh, and appropriately respond to those individuals. But a couple things that, I, um, that I, as I've been trying to take things in here. And I had mentioned that the American Academy of Pediatrics has a strategic planning initiative on epigenetics. It sees that as a significant tie-in to some of the other projects that are going on. For example, early brain and childhood development. Those issues are critically important in terms of since we now know that, that we can, if you will, screw up the expression of genes without modifying them because of epigenetic uh, factors uh, prenatally and postnatally in terms of maternal and child abuse or, what, or whatever, that we now recognize that that's a significant factor that needs to be dealt with. Uh, and the other thing is we, that we really haven't mentioned here, uh, but one of the things that came clear to me at, when, at our colloquium was that we really do not, do, we do a fairly abysmal job, I think, in terms of looking at the continuum of genetics over the lifespan. We have our own little, uh, we have prenatal, we have pediatrics, we have adult. We don't communicate very well over the lifespan of that. I mean, because so, so many things that happen prenatally and early postnatally are critical to the, the disease susceptibilities that adults have. Uh, but we have not done very well with that. So that's just another issue that I th would encourage us 
to look at to figure out how as the professional societies and these organizations work together to figure out the, the continuum of, of disease across the lifespan, not just whether you're an OBGYN, a pediatrician, or an internal medicine, or a, gerontolo or a gerontologist. And I think the thing I would add on to that is that if you look at the, um, you know, where, where the potential value of doing a genome or an exome would be, um, it is in some ways through reuse of the information. So whenever that genome is done, uh, it's done for a specific purpose, um, but there are going to be other purposes that uh, will uh, come on down the road. And so if you've done it and you can make the information persist some way and you can define, as Ned was saying earlier, the clinical context under which you would pull certain parts of that information in, then you have something where if you invest your $1,000 in your genome, you over an entire lifespan, as long as we can understand the appropriate context with which to use the information. And I think, you know, that's slightly different than the point that you were making, but it does how we need to have uh, continuity and handoffs. Um, and of course, it, it also comes back to the idea of uh, that ultimately, as, as Wolfgang was saying, there, there are going to be some huge informatics issues that are underlying that, which is where is it stored, uh, how is it transmitted, what parts are exposed to the electronic health record under what circumstances. Again, w within a disintegrated healthcare delivery system is, is, is very problematic. So there's plenty of, of grist uh, for, the, for the mill there, but uh, I think it's... Um, and one other thing I didn't, I didn't emphasize is obviously the Genetics and Primary Care Institute was, is meant to, to be an example and get collaboration from other primary care societies like a, a American Academy of Pediatrics, or excuse me, a family practice, uh, American College of Physicians. Um, arguably, we're concentrating right now on genetics because that's the group we can, or pediatrics, because that's the group we can have the most impact on and understand the most, but we would hope that these, these, these outcomes would be generalizable to other specialties. Thank you. Uh, um, Mike is the official, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot as the representative of the uh, College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, since at least since Bruce has left, and you've been uncharacteristically quiet today. So I, I didn't know if you had any specific comments or observations in, in, in uh, light of Terry's uh, request to kind of put everybody on the spot. Uh, probably nothing ter terribly useful. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, there is no organization of specialties in the country. There, I, I would say it's actually worse right now than it has been since I started in this. There's two different organizations who try to umbrella the specialties and they're at odds now. Um, so how we pull this together is going to be interesting, but I do think it's increasingly important that we do it. Um, you know, we're moving from this time where we think about the diseases in the six per person model and we're moving to variant first, which means, you know, I, I, I really sort of dread the day our guideline about incidental findings comes out because these are going to be asymptomatic people associated with specialists in other areas of medicine who don't know we're doing that. Uh, and, you know, one day we're, we're going to put out a guideline that says, you know, there's cancers, there's cardiomyopathies. If we find this variant, then we should tell this patient and begin to act on prevention and reduction of severity. So I do think that there's a lot of, there's a huge communication problem that's coming in a variant first world where the specialties aren't talking to one another, yet genetics is going to impose, uh, you know, a fair bit of itself on other specialties, uh, and they're not going to see it coming because we have no good networks in which we communicate among each other. Uh, so that, that's another uh, good um, potential functionality uh, to add to uh, this concept, which would be uh, inter-specialty communication uh, to kind of keep people up to speed, just as we did today, of what it is they're actually, uh, we're actually doing. Yeah. So I would say that, and then I would say the, I, you know, my dread in this is that we end up uh, perceived the way the Genome Institute did for a while, which was you had the technology in, in NHGRI. All the other institutes had the diseases. So to go after a disease, you had to partner up, and you brought the least amount of money to the partnership uh, because you were the smallest institute and we're the smallest specialty. So we, you know, as much as we have broad expertise and would like to bring it to these other activities, we are... Uh, careful in that we have little resource aside from knowledge to bring to the table. 
But I think there is, you know, a, a point of hope here where you, you said, you know, there, there's no sort of umbrella organization of that, and, and, uh, and while that is a challenge, we have here a, a, a nidus, an, an area mm -hmm. that we can work around that, that I think is, is exciting. The public <coughs> is interested in it. Clinicians are interested in it. You know, it's, it's very cool. Um, and and if, if we can't galvanize the societies around this, I mean, you know, the Heart Institute galvanized people around hypertension. You know, hypertension is really important, but it's not nearly as exciting as genomics and genetics. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I'm getting hypertension just thinking about it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm in, I, well, I, I agree to a, an extent. Uh, you know, my other worry really is that a lot of people representing the society has talked about the, the benefits we're going to get from integration of clinical decision support into electronic environments. You know, I don't know where that's going to come from. Um, right now, you know, an EMR CDS company talks to the guy that down the street who knows, says, I know that disease, and lo and behold, there's you know, a, a clinical decision support tool built into somebody's EMR and that... available to us? <laughs> <laughs> you know, do you want them available at, to at you is probably the popular question. rates. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's a much bigger problem than the, that industry has even thought about at this point about really how do we do this? Because this, you know, this is across all specialties when we start developing this kind of clinical decision support that guides all practitioners around what to do with, when certain things happen in the care of a patient. Howard. Back in the early 90s, or maybe it was late 80s, when the, some of the big journals decided to come up with the Van, Vancouver Agreement and the, the approach for publishing, it, it wasn't all journals. It was just some, and it wasn't any autonomy issues. It just agreed on a format, and journals that weren't at the table, some of them agreed to go after it too. And I think in some ways, you know, the rheumatologists aren't here. They've come up with pharmacogenetic guidelines in the last six months. They're influencing uh, uh, rheumatologic disease, but they're not here in the room. But if the groups that are here come up with an, uh, an approach for what is useful and what's not, including beyond genetics, uh, you know, why is amiodarone part of warfarin dosing? Never been a trial, and yet it's, it's a, a uh, factor influencing the dose selection. We, we need to be thinking more broadly how about genetics and other factors come in write some of those general rules. Societies that want to adopt that approach can. Others can do their own thing. Um, but at least there will be a, a way forward. And I think that will, will get at a lot of the frustration we have around the room. We're, we're tired of, of guidelines that kind of miss the boat. And fewer of them will miss the boat. Some will still miss the boat, but we didn't want to be on that boat anyway. Irwin. It strikes me uh, to the topic of uh, individual societies and umbrella grouping or group, et cetera, that, uh, and I'm not a member of any society that's present, represented here, and maybe you uh, have more comments to what I'm going to say, but what I was very encouraged by recently was the work of the uh, AB ABIM Foundation and the Choosing Wisely effort. And, you know, there, I think the way I understood it was they wanted to get together, and they did get together, many societies, uh, and they reached consensus on what to advise clinicians on certain tests that are overutilized. And, you know, if you have a patient with XYZ, do not do back pain, do not do a chest X-ray uh, until six weeks after presentation, things like that. Now, there must have been a process of getting these folks you know, around the table and getting them to talk, et cetera, et cetera. And I was wondering whether there's experience with this and whether that could be something one can look into. Well, certainly we have one example of how to do it, uh, which is extant, and we're currently participating in. I don't know, Mike, were you involved at all with the ABIMF um, Choosing Wisely? Okay. Okay. We believe you. <laughs> So, so I'm going to try to wrestle the moderator slot back from Mark and just point, and just point out we're, we're probably, uh, yeah, that's right, we're probably getting to the end of yep. this segment, and, and I wonder we are moving then forward to the next steps segment? Right. Or, yeah, right. So, okay, so, so, so yeah. we'll wind up. This. Right. So let me, because uh, I think we're, um, you know, I, I think if anything, um, uh, the, the things that I've heard here would... Um, uh, alter the order in the sense that the thing that uh, ultimately sort of got represented here at the bottom uh, clearly, I think, is something that people are highly interested in and energized about. And so uh, that, that will be something that um, uh, will move up, uh, uh, up the chain. The, the process um, that we envision um, 
uh, going forward will be that um, we will be, uh, you know, taking this, taking the notes that Gina's been taking, synthesize that uh, into uh, sort of a version two of uh, what we heard and um, will be, uh, that will be available to uh, be sent around and will ultimately provide the basis for a summary of the meeting. So we have another crack outside of the um, uh, walls of this meeting room uh, to provide input uh, based on reflection um, and that. But uh, I guess uh, uh, at this point, uh, what we'd like to do, um, the, th the things that I've heard that I think we can tangibly say are uh, um, next steps that, and, and uh, people can disagree, uh, but uh, certainly um, the uh, pursuing how we might be able to aggregate materials uh, in one place, and I think to some degree that would also uh, include uh, uh, professional societies that are represented here saying, we have this stuff and, and we would like this to be uh, a part of it. That could be uh, communicated to Gene and, and Gene would probably send out an email invitation uh, to that. If there are specific suggestions uh, beyond G2C2 uh, where that might occur, that can be something that you could suggest or that um, uh, the internal working group could uh, look at. Um, I think clearly, uh, we're going to, uh, the planning group is going to be um, uh, discussing uh, how we might um, uh, be able to uh, reconvene uh, probably, uh, let me just step back. The genomic medicine group will continue on and will continue to explore other topics, but I think what we've heard here is that there's an enthusiasm for uh, a group specifically around uh, professional societies to also have an opportunity to uh, convene and have um, some ongoing meetings. And so uh, that'll be something we'll need to talk about at the planning group level uh, how we might uh, operationalize um, uh, that to happen um, uh, and can, um, uh, again, if you have specific ideas about how uh, that might happen, we would uh, uh, like to uh, uh, solicit that. And the sense I'm getting is that, you know, a lot of the discussions relating to this uh, in some ways are now going to be a subset of that group discussion, that, you know, that these are an important output of professional societies, uh, but what we're really talking about now is how we might step back and look at some frameworks that could potentially inform uh, selection or other criteria, so um, uh, that would be something. So uh, are there other uh, tangible um, action steps from the discussion that um, uh, people would uh, want to put forward uh, that we should have as takeaways? Yes, Siri. So, so I, I guess I might suggest that we, we plan to have a, a follow-up, probably a conference call or whatever, okay. of, the, of the professional society representatives, either those of you who were fortunate enough to come to, to DFW or someone else from your society if, if you're not available, um, as mm -hmm. being, you know, at least the, the first group of the, the coalition of the willing, mm -hmm. um, and really try to define what are the things that we would like to get done in the next, you know, three to six months or so, and, and then and I see heads nodding around the room. So. Um, um, and I also am, am quite sensitive to, to Nancy's comment that, you know, you, we absolutely have to have the leadership of the various uh, groups on, on board with this, and to, to some, in some we do and in some we don't. Um, so we need to identify from you what's the best way to convince them of, of that. It might be, you know, here are these, these five big societies that want to be part of this, don't you want to be part two, um, but that may not be as convincing as, as really having kind of an agenda for this is what this will yeah. do for you and this is what, what uh, we'd like to get from you. Yeah, and I think one thing I would add to that, and I've heard a couple of you, you know, as you're thinking through what this might be, sort of articulate some ideas of what you heard and what you think would be most useful. I mean, Donna, you had said that, Bill, you had said that. Um, for those of you that would be willing to kind of put that down in writing, and say this is this is what we would be interested in in engaging around, and sending that to Gene. Then whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. so that it's um, not too proscriptive, but so that we can think about how we best can use the resources in the room and the resources of NHGR and the NIH even to think about how do we feed this pipeline with useful data that can be used to better improve the quality of healthcare with through genomics and. The, I think that's been an important goal. So I just want to make sure that that, that also stays on the Right. Yeah. List. No, it, it clearly is something that I, we've probably spent 
65% of the time in discussions on that issue. So I think it clearly has uh, risen to the surface as being uh, something critically important. I think the other thing that we could put on, on the table um, uh, for this uh, potential group is whether this would be the group that would be represented in the CRVR um, in, in terms of the, the concept of the, of the external professional society guidance to that specific project. So I think that would be one way to kind of pull that uh, together. And I don't know that we've, I know uh, Terry's sort of uh, grimacing there, so. I, I'm sorry, I, you know, I can't play poker for, for very clear reasons, but, um, but one, one issue we do have to be aware right. of is that in the, in the solicitation, we asked the, the applicants yes. to define that. And while I suspect they would be thrilled if they, mm -hmm. they knew that we had done some of the groundwork for them, um, I don't think it would be up to us to Correct. say, if this is the group that will work with CRVR, it would be sort of the other way around. But that's okay. a, you know, that's a, a sort of a small issue. But we also know it's a cooperative agreement, not, not wink, wink, say no more. So. <laughs> it is, and yeah, and, and I, think, I think it would be very important to have um, input from, from these societies, and this is, I, I think, what we're anticipating, and, and Aaron, you may want to comment as well, um, that the, the coordinating group or professional society group, I forgot what we called it, in CRVR would be doing, so it, it's a perfect consonant speak. Want to no, that's ab that's absolutely true, and and the only thing to add is that we'll we'll probably be seeking input from other stakeholders as well. So we'll just have to figure out you know the right approach to collecting all that information, and we can work closely with with Jean and then the grantee once they're awarded to figure out the best path for moving forward. But it would be it would be helpful for us, I think, sooner than later, to get a sense of which organizations are interested, so we can hit the ground running, you know, and work with the the grantee on moving forward. Well, and it, and it really did seem that there are many issues that are much bigger that are that are, are affecting the societies than than, yeah. than just our, our little issue yeah. of what's clinically actionable. So. Yeah, great. Uh, I, yeah, I just want to make a comment that it, you know, NichePeg was originally founded around the idea of not duplicating efforts and sharing resources and experiences around developing educational materials for healthcare provider educators, uh, healthcare providers. Uh, across all disciplines and uh, it's sort of interesting cuz the um, the issue of the uh, of the um, clinical guidelines very early on in the history of niche peg they decided not to do guidelines because all of the mm -hmm. representatives said that's you know that's the function of the societies mm -hmm. and so you know deal with the education and so maybe that the tide has uh, changed but there are lots of of um, healthcare provider organizations who are a part of niche peg who are not represented here today, and so um, I'm sure that we could, we'd be happy to disseminate the information around this, or bring other organizations to um, to, to bear on the on, on the discussion. And there's already a cadre of individuals at a lot of different societies mm -hmm. who are thinking about these yeah. issues. Okay, thank you, Joan. Very good. This has uh, been an extraordinarily um, uh, productive. A day, so I'd like you all to give yourselves a hand for all the hard work you did. Um, recognizing that uh, there are um, some folks that have earlier flights tomorrow, um, uh, we're scheduled till 5:30, um, and so uh, I'll give the group a choice. I have one brief item that I am going to bring up, um, which is an opportunity that we discussed on our planning committee call. Um, but then if people wanted to uh, adjourn at this point, we can do that, and then we would resume uh, tomorrow, uh, probably not spending much time on the recap since we essentially just did the recap, uh, but move into the presentations as listed. Alternatively, um, Derek uh, has said he could give an update on the payers meeting uh, this afternoon. So how many would just as soon we wrap up in five minutes? How many would like to hear the uh, payers' um, uh, perspective? Um, all right, we will wrap up in five minutes. So, the um, <laughs> you can come back tomorrow. Those of you who want to hear it, you're welcome to come back tomorrow. Um, so the sorry, one quick question before you move on: Is it possible to email this slide to? The people? Slider? These slides, yes. Slides, uh, yes. yes. And, okay, and actually, what I think what we will do is we will, um, we will take the uh, information from the discussion okay. and you know, use that to kind of uh, reorder and reorganize, and then we'll send out that version too. 
At which Perfect. point, if we don't have something uh, right, then please comment back and we'll fix it before Thank it goes you. final. So the opportunity we have uh, that I mentioned in the planning committee call um, is that uh, the American Journal of Medical Genetics has a seminar series, quarterly semin seminar, um, uh, that is a, an issue devoted to a um, specific topic. And um, I've edited a couple of these in the past, and I was talking with the editor and mentioned that we have this genomic medicine implementation group and proposed the idea that we could do an issue um, of papers on implementation projects that uh, groups around the table uh, are doing. Um, so this would be an opportunity to basically um, uh, put uh, a number of the things that we're doing into uh, a published form through a peer-reviewed uh, journal, um, uh, but would have the visibility of having a, a single uh, a, a topic issue um, that uh, I would be willing to uh, edit. And so I just wanted to get a sense from the group whether that's something uh, you would like to pursue. Um, is there anybody that is violently opposed uh, other than, well, I'm not sure Dan is violently opposed. Uh, he just wants us to make sure we say something. Um, and he's in Belgium, so who cares? Um, uh, <laughs> uh, anybody that has an, uh, objections to moving forward with that? Or discussion, questions? Can I see a rough show of hands of people who have a paper in the works that they would like to consider submitting to such an issue? One, two, implementation. Three, four. Okay, we've got an issue there. So uh, I will, uh, <laughs> I will uh, ask those of you who uh, are interested to, if you could submit um, uh, just, uh, uh, you know, a title uh, and a brief uh, um, uh, uh, summary of what it is you would like to say, then I can put together a draft table of contents, propose that uh, to the editor. I think it will be accepted, and we would be looking at um, the January 2014 uh, seminars issue, meaning that we would probably be looking to have papers uh, by September. So, great. I will be in communication with the group. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, one one issue I was supposed to announce for the periodontal microbiome group. You'll be meeting in the in the breakout room, um, which is room D, just down the hall here. The cancer working group is not going to meet. So, but the the periodontal group is is next door. Right, and it's equipped with a spit sink, so you're in good shape there. So. <laughs>